Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Previously on here I did a video which turned out to be very popular. I had noticed that no one had broken down or analysed World War II gun camera footage and so I did an analysis on interesting or rare Luftwaffe gun camera footage and a number of people said they wanted a similar video from the Allied perspective. And given that there is a lot more surviving and interesting Allied footage available, thanks to the propaganda savvy and, let's be honest, raw ego of the back-to-back -back World War champions, I felt it was finally time to have a look. But before that, I have a special announcement. Ya boy has finally made it, because this video is sponsored by none other than World of Warships. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the legends over at Wargaming have kindly sponsored this video to promote their absolutely incredible free-to-play naval combat game, World of Warships. And as someone who already plays this game too much for his own good, I can wholeheartedly recommend it. You want to know how much I love this game? When they offered to sponsor me, I used it as an excuse to justify buying more premium ships. That's right, I gave them some of their money back just so I could pick up some ships I've been wanting. It's that good. The graphics are amazing. I can pick out individual details on the ships as they sail through gorgeous environments with incredible water effects and atmospheric weather. And wouldn't you know it, the ships are historically accurate. They even come with some different upgrades and refits that they had received throughout their service lives historically. It's crazy. And this is spread across the entire range of ship classes. You can play as destroyers, battleships, carriers, cruisers, and even submarines, which you can then use to do battle in massive 12v12 PvP matches that are truly a sight to behold. And it never, ever gets boring no matter how much you play. New content comes out every month with different cosmetics, skins, flags, and even ships, with the newest release being their special event, Treasure Hunt, which is running right now until December 13th, where you can win any of these prizes here. Just look at them all. So much to do. But the best part is, you can do it with anyone, anywhere. That's right, you can bring your friends if you want to or go solo, depending on what you feel like, and you can do it on either PC or console. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description and use promo code BRAVO on sign up to get exclusive rewards. That's right, promo code BRAVO. Remember it and use it. Link in the description. World of Warships. Now, on to the video. Alrighty guys, here we are with Allied Gun Camera, specifically American Gun Camera. I've decided to keep uh, the Battle of Britain Gun Camera and some of the other interesting stuff I found for a later video, but I went through the archives and found what I think is the most interesting American gun camera I could find. So keep in mind that this is interesting American gun camera, okay? I don't know, maybe some British gun camera snuck in here somewhere, but as I said with the Luftwaffe one, I'm trying to find the most interesting clips I could find, all right? And we're going to start off with the coolest ones, all right? Here we go. Some of you may have noticed what aircraft this is already, but we'll wait till we get a good plan form shot and bang. Look at that. Here we have twin engines, one under each wing, a wide track landing gear, and no propeller. And of course the T-tail and the wide shark-like body with a swept back wing. Ladies and gentlemen, what we are looking at is an ME262. Now, you'll know this as the first operational jet fighter ever to see service in an air force and in combat. And you'll notice, looking at it, it's obviously either just taking off or just landing. Now, the reason for doing this is quite simple. Uh, you can't catch it once it's airborne. Now, this is a bit of a misnomer or rather a bit of an oddity because... Standard operating procedure for the Luftwaffe eventually when operating jet squadrons would be to have conventional piston engine fighters sitting above the 262's field to guard their landing and takeoff procedure because they wanted to keep them alive until they got up to altitude and speed so they could go off and intercept the bomber streams. So this P-51 pilot is either catching this guy in an early phase before this safety procedure was put in place or he's running the gambit or his friends have chased off the escorts. But either way, he has caught this 262 on either takeoff or landing. I'm guessing takeoff by the looks of it, given the speed he's going and the direction, because we don't see a field or an airfield in front of him. So he's jumped this 262, and um, things are not looking good for this guy. 
Yep, you can see we don't really have an airfield. We sort of got open farmland in front of us. So my guess is he's taken off from the airfield. The Mustang's seen him take off, and he's jumped him. Uh, and uh, look, the maneuverability of the 262 is not very good. She's very heavy, and the Yumo... Well, basically, the key for jet aircraft that you will have noticed is that early jets have two engines instead of just one. Most piston engine fighters have one engine, jets have two. Reason being simply is because the earliest models of jet were not powerful enough. And especially the German jets, while effective, instead of uh, the centrifugal flow jets that you would see among the Allied designs, the Germans were the first to pioneer axial flow engines. The only downside to that being, especially on the UMO engines that are attached to this 262, is they have to have a complete engine rebuild <laughs> every 10 hours of flight or so. And if you added too much throttle on takeoff, or uh, basically too much throttle at any time, you could overload the fuel system and pour liters of gasoline into, or aviation gas, straight into the hot engine, which would then start a critical engine fire, which would blow up the engine. So, uh, not exactly the most reliable engines, and really their deployment, uh, and that of the 262, was really hamstrung by the shortage of engines rather than airframes. Although, given the damage uh, done by 8th Air Force raids to the Regensburg uh, Messerschmitt plant, a large number of earlier 262s were destroyed during those efforts. So, all around, the 262 was, as uh, my favorite historian James Holland likes to say, too little too late. And here we see one caught in the gun camera of a Mustang, and he's caught him... He's caught him while airborne, so he's probably caught him on the climb out, and as you can see... He's caused significant damage to the starboard engine. And so what this 262 is dealing with, as you can see, you've got the uh, cockpit tail assembly. It's actually a really nice plan form. You've got the four 30mm Mark 108 cannons in the nose here. What's happened is, because the Mustang has critically damaged the starboard engine, he now has asymmetric thrust. Which means this left engine here is pumping out a great deal of thrust while this starboard engine has been damaged and is quite possibly stalled or planed out. And as you can see, oh, he's, he's rolling over. He's got smoke trailing out of this one. You can see bullet impacts on the wings here. And he's gone asymmetric. And, yep, <laughs> he's now in a cartwheel. And the Mustang pulls off and reattacks, and there you see him again. He's cartwheeling off. So, asymmetric thrust into a fatal spin. That is... That is nasty. That is, oh, oh, nasty one. But this is a good demonstrator of why you don't let the 262s get to altitude. Now, this is taken from a Mustang who's trying to get his nose up to engage it. So he's come out of a dive, probably, you can kind of tell, even on the black and white footage, you can kind of tell that the sky up here is darker and we're contrailing. So we're up really high. Uh, these aren't chemical trails poisoning your brain um, for the government. No, this is hot air coming out of the back of the engines of your aircraft in cold air, which vaporizes, causing a trail. There you go. See? Right. Now, here is the thing. This Mustang has probably come out of a dive or he's at full chat. He's going fast. But I want you to pay attention to something. You notice how... When he's trying to keep his nose on the on the 262, you see how how he's just how the nose, how the camera angle is just sort of waving about. That is because the Mustang who's taking these shots is at the very edge of a stall. He is pulling up into the 262 and he just doesn't have enough speed. His propeller is not getting enough air at this altitude, and he's not going fast enough to keep his nose stable and on the target. And as you can see. Once the 262 is up to speed, he's just climbing away. He's just turning away. He's just gaining distance. This guy is just flying away. This Mustang cannot do anything. This 262 is gone. See you later. Goodbye. See? He's in space. He doesn't need to be here. I'm away. This guy, however, isn't getting away. <laughs> because this guy is... I'm guessing at this stage, seeing as how close we are, and uh, the fact that he's in a descent and we don't see any stream, this is an ME-163 rocket-powered interceptor, which we discussed before on the Luftwaffe video, only this one is from the uh, Mustang's perspective. 
Now, I made an error in my Luftwaffe video uh, regarding the armament of the photocell activated weapon system, uh, which some of you quite rightly pointed out in the comments. So full disclosure and uh, full accountability. I misspoke. It was in fact a trigger for rocket systems to fire out of the ventral section of the uh, 163, not 30 millimeter cannons. Okay, so that's my fault. My fault. I should have made sure I wasn't talking out of my ass when I said that, but this is rather irrelevant here. I just want to keep myself accountable to my audience. This, however, is not a good situation for Mr. ME163 because we don't see a stream. We don't see him rocketing away at high speed, which means he is now a glider. <laughs> This uh, 163 is now a glider. He has no power, no propulsion. He is gliding back down to Earth. Now, this is actually quite dangerous because the ME163's fuel sources, um, C stuff and T stuff, they are actually quite volatile. In fact, they are probably some of the most volatile fuels on the planet. The reason why the ME163 is able to maintain such a small size while gaining such high speed and such high performance is because the reactivity of the fuels that they're mixing are actually insane. The downside of this is, if there's any residual fuel in this 163 that hasn't burned off or is having issues, if this P-51 hits him and he's got uh, residual fuel on board, he could explode very badly and definitely blow up the Mustang. Likewise, if he lands too hard on his landing skid, and that's actually an interesting point, you'll notice he doesn't have any landing gear, the ME163 detaches its landing gear on takeoff, so he doesn't have any wheels. That little bulge here is his landing skid, and that's his tail, his tail wheel. So he is going to have a really bad day one way or the other. If he's got residual fuel on board, he is going to explode, either from the bullets from this Mustang or from a hard landing, or he's going to get shot down and he's going to have to bail. But, yep. Oh boy. <laughs> I would not want to be flying near this thing. I definitely would not want to be flying near this thing. Absolutely not. Here is a crossing shot on another ME163. This is a different one, but you get a sort of better idea of the sort of glider plan form. If you look at that swept wing, it's such a beautiful little design. Incredibly dangerous for its crews and its mechanics, but it's just a wonderful looking design. I really do like the ME163. However, no mercy. <laughs> now back to conventional uh, conventional gun camera here. So this is a BF109G series. So we'll wind it back here. Just give it a little bit here. Strafes him on the ground. He's at his airfield, obviously. Here we go. So this is a BF109G model. Obviously at full chat. Radiator flaps are completely closed. Full power. And what I wanted to show with this piece of footage here is just how close you can get in aerial combat. You see, a lot of the time you see in movies these pilots making incredible shots, and even in simulators, but more commonly in video games like Blazing Angels or something like that, you'll see, or Ace Combat, for example, you'll see people making shots at ridiculous distances, but in reality, you get close. Oh. So you can see how close we are here. So there you go. BF-109 G series. With the new Galand hood. Because you don't see the uh, tighter frame. The sort of more boxy frame on the cockpit. Sort of angled sweep back. So yeah. So it's a late model BF-109 G. And he's just come up behind him and clubbed him over the head basically. Not much he can do there. Now this clip is interesting. Same thing. BF-109 G. Now, one thing I would like to say in terms of basic fighter maneuvering, one mistake that this pilot is making. A lot of the time, I mean, at this point, Nazi Germany was down to very inexperienced pilots with the few exceptions. So there were Expauten, pilots who'd been flying, you know, since the start of the war. By 1944-45, the Luftwaffe was really struggling with recruits. They didn't have enough fuel and enough aircraft for training. And so a lot of pilots were going up completely unprepared. By contrast, Allied pilots, especially US pilots, were going in with like 80 to 100 hours in training before they even got to a combat unit. So this guy here is, a, is in a climbing left turn, and climbing 
is one of the worst things you can do when being pursued because you are unless you're really fast you're gonna be losing energy really quickly which in, which increases the closure rate while you're unable to maneuver because you don't have enough speed and because of that you're also reducing the relative speed and closure of the mustang or p47 that's chasing you while giving him a plan form shot look at this shot like he can't miss from here he can't miss but what's really interesting about this shot is it also demonstrates just how crowded the sky can be in a dogfight you tend to lose situational awareness in a massive furball you can't keep track of everyone you can keep track of your wingman if you stay in with them so your wingman so flights of two can generally keep with each other but generally speaking furballs massive dogfights are chaos and we'll see just why yeet <laughs> That is a P-38 Lightning. Looks like a J-model P-38 Lightning. This P-38 Lightning just rips through. He's coming in to shoot this BF-109, and this P-38 just thunders through his shot. Just thunders on through. Very lucky he doesn't get shot, <laughs> quite frankly. But that leads me to think that this is a flight of P-38s that this guy's in, so we're in a P-38 right now in our gun camera and you can kind of tell from the concentration of fire a p47 and a p51 has a bank of six or eight machine guns in their wings which converge on a point whereas if you saw that shot there the shots were very clustered like a group of nose guns fired that shot plus one of those impacts looked like a 20 millimeter cannon round so i'm guessing we're looking at this this gun camera belongs to a p38 Ba-ba-bum. Yep. Now, amazingly, despite taking hits, the pilot seems to have survived because at this moment here, you can see he's pulled the jettison handle, so the red jettison handle at the 11 o'clock of the cockpit. So 11 o'clock relative to the pilot. There is a red jettison handle for the canopy of the F-109. He pulls it, canopy jettisons, and the pilot jumps out. This guy, not so lucky. Oof. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure what happened here. But if you look at the speed this 109 is going, he's going really quick. And he's taking shots. It's very possible that the pilot, he's either blacked out, or he's lost situational awareness, or he may have been killed. But another bad habit of the 109 is it does tend to compress... Its flight surfaces tend to lose authority when it reaches seriously high speed. So he may have been trying to dive away from his attacker, unable to recover from the dive. Oof. Impacts the ground. Now this is a rather sad piece of footage here. Because those of you who recognize aircraft may notice what this is. This is a de Havilland Mosquito which is a British aircraft made of wood, the wooden wonder, as it was known. Very high speed, usually used in photo reconnaissance. This is a photo reconnaissance version, actually. You can, excuse me, <clears throat> you can tell because, well, I know because the uh, gun camera says that it was a photo reconnaissance variant, a PR flight, but it's not armed and it's flying on its own. So it's not part of a flight, he's just flying around on his own, and he's not armed. So what he is, is he's out on a reconnaissance mission by himself, and an American fighter has seen this guy, and he's misidentified him. Now, you can see the roundels on the wings here, just very vaguely. So misidentification of aircraft happens all the time. I actually get quite a laugh out of it a lot of the time, because when they do the gun camera footage... When they do the gun camera footage for the uh, wing intelligence or for the newsreel, whatever they're doing it for, they put a placard in front identifying what the aircraft is they're attacking and who the pilot is a lot of the time. And when looking at German gun camera and British gun camera, I'm looking at it and they're like, oh, this is this plane. And then when you look at it, it's clearly something completely different. So... You know, misidentification happens all the time. Now, the Mosquito in this case was reported to have been a 
Messerschmitt 410, which was the development of the Messerschmitt 210, which in turn was a development or the supposed upgrade to the Messerschmitt 110 or 110, 110. And so he sees the rounded fuselage. He sees the rounded fuselage and the tail and the sort of elliptical wing shape slightly swept with twin engines and he thinks aha this is a me410 however the position of the wings and the type of engines are wrong as is the cockpit layout the tail is a little bit similar but at a quick glance it's not an american aircraft because he doesn't recognize it he doesn't know it's a british aircraft he's unfamiliar with you wouldn't see a mosquito generally because They'll either be on low-level attack flights, on high-level recon flights like this one, or they'll be pathfinding for the bombers in the middle of the night. So an American pilot wouldn't see this very often. And so he's identified it. He's seen a lone aircraft flying in their airspace that he doesn't recognize, and so he attacks it and identifies it as an ME-410. However, it is in fact an RAF photo reconnaissance to Haviland Mosquito, and this is friendly fire. This, however, is not friendly fire. This is a Heinkel 115 float plane. One of several which we'll see coming up. And uh, he is currently parked. Now, Heinkel float planes were used for air-sea rescue, but they were also used for anti-shipping patrols and liaison with the Kriegsmarine. So, legitimate military target. He's just parked. And, uh, yeah. They have been chosen for deletion. That's actually a better shot. You can tell it's a Heinkel design here. Um, it, this is a really good shot to show you its Heinkel design. Because if you look at that wing shape, that is very, very similar to the wing of an HE-111. So, very, very obviously a Heinkel 115 float plane. Tail. Very, very good aircraft, actually, but... This one is... <laughs> the 8th Air Force playing dirty. <laughs> it's fair. It's on an enemy airfield. Military aircraft taking off, legitimate target. Uh, but it is playing dirty a little bit. Now, the 8th Air Force originally were forced to do close escort to the bombers, much like the Luftwaffe was during the Battle of Britain. However, eventually, the 8th Air Force decided to allow their Mustangs to detach ahead of the Flying Fortresses and the B-24s to free hunt over German airfields to suppress the enemy air defense before they could get airborne. And this is what this Mustang is doing. Oh. Gets him, and then finds another 109 parked on the runway. Now this one's really interesting, because... Oh. That hits. Now this is what I find a really cool piece of footage. Not so much for the content, but you can see that these high-altitude dogfights really do have a spectacular look to them. My grandfather used to tell me stories about London during the Blitz, during the Battle of Britain, where he would look up into the sky and see all of these contrails of 109s and Spitfires flying in circles, as well as the bombers up in formation. So you can sort of see the formation off. If I can... You can see that. You can see the long streams of the formations here and the fighters crisscrossing between them. It's quite a stunning image. This one's interesting because if you look, this 109 had a expandable fuel tank or an ex a drop tank. And when, during the engagement process, the... Um, during the engagement process, the Mustang has fired and hit the drop tank, causing a huge ball of fire. I would not like to be that German pilot. I would be feeling very uncomfortable right now. And here we are at high altitude again. And you can see the damage those 50 cows can do. Look at that left aileron. It is completely shredded. That BF-109's left aileron is completely shredded. This one's interesting because you can see the canopy fly off. And there's the pilot. Jumps out. And there's his shoot. <laughs> and talk about close calls. As I was mentioning before, how close you can get in a dogfight. Look at this. Engaging, engaging. Whoa. You are touching him. Keep in mind that the gun camera is sort of mounted sort of just to the left, I believe, on the Mustang. So his prop hub, his propeller is like just over right of frame here. He's about to hit this guy. 
Oh. Now this one's really interesting because it shows you a very interesting phenomenon. So as I mentioned before, P-51s and P-47s and Spitfires, and of course the aircraft we're shooting at, the Focke Wolf 190, have their guns mounted in the wings. So you have to use something called convergence, which is you harmonize your guns, which is the process that you do with this. You harmonize your guns so that the bullets all reach an area of sky in front of your aeroplane that crisscross one another at a certain distance. And that's the distance you want to shoot at. Now with nose mounted guns, like in a P-38 or a BF-109, the general adage is closer the better. But sometimes that's not always the case. A lot of fighter pilots originally had their guns harmonized out to 300 to 400 yards, but that's way too far for effective shooting. So you generally had them harmonized at around 150, 200 yards, really close. So you can shoot while keeping your guns on target. And so all of your bullets sort of cross the same area of sky at the same time. If you look here, this P-51 pilot has caught this 190 who's very obviously a new pilot. He's he's on his first patrol or something. I don't know what this guy's doing, but he's he's on his own and he's been snuck up on. We're in his blind spot. We're right behind his seat at his low six. So this 190 can't see us. He's been snuck up on. And you can see the Mustang start to engage. Now you saw the impacts of the bullets there. Right? You saw one impact there, one impact there. We are inside the P-51's gun harmonization. So his bullets are meeting each other out here somewhere. That's for a second. His bullets are meeting each other out here somewhere. So when he's firing... He's only hitting part of the aircraft. His guns are actually not as doing as much damage as they could be because he's, ironically enough, too close. So what he's doing here, you see him drop the nose and pull up. He's reducing, he's reducing his, he's like burning off extra energy by going up and trying to get lateral separation and vertical separation again, away from the 190 so he can come back down. So he comes back down. There you go. Trying to burn off speed to stay behind him. And you can see... He's sort of wiggling left or left to right, right to left, trying to stay behind him. So, <laughs> so he comes in and shoots. He comes in and shoots right here. He realizes he's too close. He's going to overshoot. So he tries to cut level separation off. He tries to get back. Uh, going to come back again. Uh, guns aren't working. Going to come back again. And there we go. Now, this clip, this clip and the next clip demonstrate something which is very important in aerial combat called target fixation. Target fixation is the deadliest thing in aerial combat. It's what gets you killed 100% of the time, and it's, well, not 100, 90% of the time, and it's why you always try and fly with a wingman when you can. Because when you are trying to shoot somebody, you are at your most vulnerable because you are focusing your attention to carry out your mission and destroy the target. The problem is, because you're focusing on the target, you're not looking behind you. Every fight, <clears throat> excuse me, every fighter pilot, and some of you in the comments who are watching this may very well be fighter pilots, can tell you, and even after the tragic events at the Dallas Air Show made apparent, loss of situational awareness is the number one thing that will get you killed. And when you're in combat flying, target fixation is the other big contributor to loss of situational awareness. You will not see what you're shooting at. You will not see what's shooting at you because you're too busy trying to shoot your guy in front of you. So as you can see here, I'll just... Okay, so just in front of frame, I'm just going to bring it bring it back a little bit. Bring it back. So you can see that sort of outline there. Those are a pair of Mustangs. It's a pair of P-51s that have just crossed in front of us. And there's a 109 crossed in front of us. That 109 has seen those two Mustangs and he's gone, Oh, I'm above them. I'm behind them. I can turn in on their six o'clock. He hasn't seen us in the P-51 coming up behind him. He hasn't seen us. And the result is, uh, well... Now this is another example, and it's also a really piece of inf interesting footage, excuse me. That, over there, is a Avro Lancaster. It's a British Lancaster, 
four inch and bomber on a daylight raid so that's very rare to start with this is a focal wolf 190a variant can't tell exactly what because i can't see the front of it can't see its armament layout but he is engaging this lancaster because he is so focused on shooting that lancaster he has not seen us in the mustang or the p47 or the p38 flying up right behind him And so even though we're hitting him right now, he's so focused on killing this Lancaster, he's not taking evasive action, he's just flying straight and level and shooting the Lancaster. You can see flame from the poor inboard engine right here. So that Lancaster ha is going down. You can see the, it's starting to nose down. Inboard left engine fire. Diving off to starboard. The 190 realizes he's being attacked and starts evading to the right. But he's too late. And this Mustang just goes to town. Now this is a good example of deflection shooting. As you can see, this 190 is in a hard left turn. He is in a really hard left turn. And you can see that he's in the bottom right of frame. That's because our Mustang pilot is aiming out here. The Mustang pilot's guns are aimed out here. He's shooting here. And look at that. Just look at that. Perfect aim. Perfect. Again, a deflection shot. This is a quarter deflection shot. So low aspect. So it's not as tight as that one just there. But if you look here. Ooh. Shot ignites his ammunition and fuel storage. So the guns for the 190 are in the wing. So he has cannons here. So you can see these small protrusions here. This looks like an A8 model 190. Excuse me. There's little protrusions. So they look like cannons. Heavy 30 millimeter cannons. So he's got 20 mils, 30 mils, 20 mil, 30 mil, and his machine guns right here. So he's got a lot of high explosive cannon ammo running through these wings, plus inboard here and here, the primary fuel tanks. And so our Mustang pilot fires. And, oh, yeah. Kaboom. And this is just a montage of ground strafing with some really impressive explosions, so I'll just let this run. Now this is interesting footage because they're shooting what I believe to be maybe a water tower or a, I think it's a water tower maybe? Um... Water tower, grain silo. I'm I'm pretty sure it's a water tower. I'm not sure. But what's interesting is in left of frame, this is a P47 D11 Razorback Thunderbolt in all her glory. I have a very soft spot for the P47. Very beautiful aircraft. You can see it hasn't got the teardrop. It's got the Razorback cockpit, so it's an earlier P47. Doesn't have the invasion stripes on yet, so this is pre-D-Day. Massive. Massive R2800 Twin Wasp just thundering away. Beautiful engine. Beautiful aircraft. And here is here is that shot from above for another aircraft seeing it in. And yeah. P47 has eight machine guns. So if you just look at that huge cloud here, just 850 caliber machine guns. 850 cals just blasting away. Just... Look at those impacts, and just in this shot here, look at the amount of tracer that's flying out of this aircraft. It's truly impressive. Now this is really impressive because it's a 190. You can tell he's at slow speed. He's losing control. The Focke Wolf 190 has a really nasty tendency to torque spin, which is when the motor torque of an aircraft and the airflow, the various aerodynamic forces at slower speeds mean that the 190 is very susceptible to sort of poor controllability at slow speeds. So he's wallowing around and this Mustang is right on his tail and is about to end his whole career and starts shooting. The pilot decides that this is not the go and leaves the aircraft and he bails out and shoot opens. So he made it. There he is. And as you can see, look at that. There is a dogfight in progress at high altitude. Just look at those contrails. But more of interest is this Focke Wolf 190. He's being trailed. He's under fire. He's trying to maneuver out of the gun, the gun solution here, but he can't get away with it. And yeah. 
50 cals hit like a truck, and you can see that the left wing has been completely torn off by the fire. Now this is not a fuck all of 190. We're in the interesting part now because, ladies and gentlemen, we are switching over to the Far East. The Pacific. This is very rare footage, actually. Very, very rare. This is a KI-84. And you don't see many of these. It is an Imperial Japanese Army Air Forces fighter. But like all Japanese fighters, it has a very nasty tendency to catch fire. In color too, you can see the squadron marking along the fuselage there, the, the white arrow through the red sun. Very, very cool. Well, it's not cool. It's gonna, be, gonna get very, very warm in a second. Yep. And this shot's really amazing. So this is an A6M5A0. Late war with a drop tank on board, no less. And this is why you should always pay, pay attention. This F6F, completely, completely blind to his wingman, just swings right into his gun solution. Swings right in, guns blazing, and engages this zero. And kills him. This is a very rare aircraft. You don't see these very often. In fact, this is the only color footage I know of of this aircraft that survives. In fact, I think it's the only color footage of this aircraft, and the maybe even the only film footage of it that survives. This is an Aichi B7A. A Grace, as it was code, as it was codenamed, or the Shooting Star. It's very rare. Not many of these were built. And you can see it's got a very distinctive gullwing design. And this clip is really cool because you can see him pull right up. Look at those wingtip vortices off that aircraft. It's very fast, very strong, and very maneuverable. It's the best torpedo bomber that the Japanese Navy ever fielded. And there weren't that many. I mean, I think there was only like a hundred of these ever built. This is a very rare aircraft to see, and it's very cool. Not going to help him, though. And that's a zero. Yep. Excellent crossing shot. So we rewind and watch that again. It's a very interesting angle that you get here because this zero is obviously in a turn and he's done the mistake of turning in front of an enemy aircraft and going belly up. So he has no idea that this F6F is here. Can't see him. Doesn't see him. And he just gets this quick opportunity for a snapshot and whack. That huge cloud of fuel. That zero is probably going to go go down on fire. They don't have self-sealing fuel tanks, so that's going to be an issue. Now, this is very interesting. If you look at that aircraft, you would swear, you would absolutely swear that is a C-47. But you can also clearly see Japanese yellow kanji fin flash and Imperial Japanese markings. That is a Japanese-built C-47. It was built under license, no less. It is a Showa Nakajima LT-2D. It is a Japanese-built C-47. And uh, a very dead one at that. It has currently been hit along the primary fuel tank in board of the wings, starting a huge fire. Will definitely not survive. But that's where you get a better view here. But you get a, a view from the rear area. You can see the uh, exposed but retracted landing gear here. The fire starting here. And then it pulls alongside here. He drops the landing gear. I don't know what aircraft we're in. It's a very interesting aircraft. We're obviously in a twin engine aircraft that engaged it. We could be... It's not a P-38. We could be... In a... Uh... F7F? I'm not sure, actually. Or maybe a P61 Black Widow? It's definitely a twin-engined aircraft, and the spinner is chunky, as they say. I'm not exactly sure what aircraft this was taken from, but I would be leaning I would be leaning towards a F7F twin-engine, the Tiger Cat. 
But again, that didn't see much service, so... Could be a P61 Black Widow. Anyway. This is very interesting footage, because this is taken from the Flying Tigers in China. This is very early gun camera footage. We have early Japanese bombers. These are Ki-27s, I believe. Although the video quality is a bit hard to make out. Ki-27, I think. But we are taking this footage from a Flying Tiger, so a P-40, over China. This footage was taken over China in 1941. And it's some of the oldest available American gun camera footage. Truly quite remarkable stuff. And he gets really close too. And this finally is really interesting. This is a P-38 Lightning and he is engaging a Japanese balloon bomb. So in an effort to attack the American mainland, the Japanese would fit, uh, fit bombs to weather balloons and launch them from submarines or even from Japan sometimes, from the Aleutian Islands. And they would let them float over the American mainland, which when they reach the critical altitude and the balloon bursts, it would drop the payload. So you see the hot air balloon or the weather balloon here. You can see the payload underneath. And these P-38s have been assigned to intercept them. Really interesting stuff. Really fascinating, actually. You don't see much of it. You can tell, again, you can tell how high we are because even in black and white, you can see that the sky is dark. This is, this is up really high. And there you have it. American gun camera. Please like and subscribe and do make sure to use promo code BRAVO in the comments and download World of Warships. Thank you very much, World of Warships, for the sponsor. Remember all of the benefits you get from signing up. Please click the link, sign up to World of Warships. Very big thank you to them. Thank you to Wargaming and thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you next time. Please tell me if you want more of this because I actually really enjoy doing gun camera footage stuff. I really do love it. It is my passion in life, World War II aviation, so any, any opportunity to do it. Anyway, guys, see you later.